Welcome back. AC lesson number 12, how to do a compressor job. You remember the six reasons we're doing this, the six ways compressors go bad. I put them in order at the top of the list, leaks, leaks, and more leaks, internal damage, leakage with worn rings and cylinders. Compressors get noisy, whether it's on the inside or the outside. Compressors get locked up. They completely seize. They have electrical problems going open or short with the clutch coil. And then you have excessive air gap and you'll get a bonus lesson that you're going to enjoy the end of this one. First, you have to recover all the refrigerant that may be in the system, whether it's just a few pounds or a full, sit, full charge. EPA requires that you recover and not allow refrigerant to be vented into the atmosphere. While you are recovering, because it could take five minutes, eight minutes, or a little bit longer, depending on how much it has in there, you're going to work on the belt. Some belts are easy, quick and easy, and some are not. You're going to remove the compressor because you're replacing it. Some compressors are fairly easy, and some are not. You can do it by the book, or you can freestyle. By the book means to follow the written instructions in the pro demand. It has the compressor removal instructions. It has the installation. They're almost always there. Freestyle is, well, you just figure it out as you go. Well, how should you do it? Well, it depends. If the compressor looks like an easy one, go for it. If you're not sure, look it up. The information is there step by step on how to remove and install the compressor. Okay, so far so good. You got the compressor off. It's time to match up the parts. On the left, we have the new. On the right, we have the old. Sometimes you have to move a couple of pieces over. It's not unusual for some compressors to come in the box like this. You'll have to take that cover off. Then you'll have to remove the manifold from the old compressor, clean it up, and install it onto the new one. Sometimes certain pressure switches do not come with the compressors. For a long time, plenty of them did not come with the pressure switch and you had to move it over. Sometimes it came with the pressure switch, sometimes it didn't. The very next step is to drain the new compressor, whether it's new, remand, rebuild, whatever you want to call it, it's very important that we drain it now. The instructions, if you buy new or rebuild, it's going to have instructions. The compressor will have information about the oil. And nowadays, it says it has three ounces. Okay, that's bullshit. I'll call them a line sack of shit. Pinche cabrones. Do not pay attention to the instructions. Pay attention to your instructor. I know what I'm talking about. Well, at least you don't have to put up with this BS. You were supposed to measure the compressor, the new one, the old one, do a little formula, just put in what it calls for. Some compressors have a drain fill plug. Does this one have one? I see it. If it doesn't have a drain fill plug, you still drain it. Remember, these are little engines. This one looks like the six cylinder. How about you? You drain it. Now, in this particular image, there's a lots of oil coming out of there. But most of the time, if you drain the old one, you, you're going to want to know well, how much is in there. You're going to want to know well, how much did the old compressor have, because that's going to help you decide how much to put into the whole system sometimes. While you're draining the new one, I like to get all of it out. How do I get all of it out? Well, I take a tool to start turning the clutch so I can work the guts, move the pistons, and try and get all the oil out. The first step in replacing, installing the compressor is to drain the new one. After the new one is completely drained, now you know where you're starting from. It's time to add the oil. Whoa, there's something very wrong here. Can you figure out what's going on wrong? He's putting it into the wrong opening. What difference does it make? Because it is highly recommended that you blank the blank 
after you add the oil and you figure out the blanks, it's highly recommended, the image gives it away, that you rotate the clutch. The purpose of rotating the clutch is to try to get the oil smeared out in all the cylinders. We pour the oil in. I'm going to tell you how much you're going to put in there. Yes, there's an in and the out, just like an engine intake and exhaust. And if you put it in the discharge, if you put it in the discharge and then turn the clutch, guaranteed it's going to spill it out. Pouring it into the wrong opening is, un, is not correct. It's marked suction discharge. That's what the S and the D are for. But a good tech, he doesn't have to look. He can tell. It is the larger opening of the two. This is an average compressor, and there's two openings on there. The one on the right is pretty obvious. It is bigger. That's where the suction line goes in. That is the inlet. That's where you're supposed to put the oil, not in the other one. The other one's discharge. Half the time when you start putting it into the discharge side, it doesn't take it. And then when you rotate it, well, it pukes it out. There is an important place to put the oil. What kind is easy? We're not done with the oil information. There's a few pads. The big question is, well, how much are you going to put in there? Here is a general rule of thumb. You're going to put half of system capacity. The vehicle has system capacity for the oil, system capacity for the refrigerant, the manufacturer provides specifications. The pro to man is easy to find. Well, how much oil does it call for? I'll show you how to do that when we get back to the lab. You're going to want to add one more. So if the system takes eight, half of eight is four plus one is five. You're going to want to put five ounces. Don't be pinched with the oil. Be generous. That oil is good. I like that oil. Do not put of system capacity. Do not put all of system capacity in there. Anybody got an idea why? It's not a good idea to pour all of oil into the suction. The technical term is called hydrostatic lock. The nickname is liquid lock. Any way you're screwing it up, it's just like an engine. It is possible that one, one or two cylinders gets too much oil, and then when you start it up, it's going to damage it. So where do you put the other one, the other half of the oil? Well, if it has an accumulator, that's where you're going. If it has a dryer, it's a big maybe. The idea is you want half in the compressor and half somewhere else because that's the way it really operates. While the system is operating, approximately half of the oil capacity is going to kind of in and out of the compressor while the other half is circulating. If you have the accumulator, you're going to pour the other half into the accumulator. Dryers, they take a little longer. The open is a little smaller. This is not going to work. On those dryers that have the cartridge, usually the plug is on the bottom. And no, you're not going to be able to do that. So how are you going to do it? I suggest to put it into either a liquid line or a discharge hose somewhere. After you have added the oil, you're going to put the caps back on or something to keep them from what? So you don't blank any. You're in the installation of the compressor. No telling what angle you're going to have to put it on so you don't spill any. The next step before you connect the hoses is to lubricate the seals. All seals and O-rings go lubricated. The oil is very important. Again. The oil is important for many reasons. It's part of the sealing process. Whether it's an O-ring or a seal, the oil is part of the sealing process. Without the oil, it's probably not going to work. Installing them dry is going to leak sooner or later. Putting the oil will help to prevent damaging, cutting, rolling. It makes for an easier installation when it's time to get the O-rings to made up. It's the professional way. Do it right. Don't do it the other way. You connect the hoses to the compressor. Okay. Now it's time to get the accumulator or dryer ready. Important information. The drying element, whether it's an accumulator or dryer, should be 
absolutely the last part to put on. After you've put on the compressor, the hoses, the lines, the valves, and after you've connected everything, after you have the seals lubricated, you have the tools ready, because when you open up the drying element, and there's three versions of it, accumulator, dryer, and cartridge, when you uncap, unseal, open package, you're going to be in a hurry. The faster you put that on, the better. If these guys are exposed to the air, they're going to absorb moisture. You might get away with it for a little bit, but I swear the faster you put them on, the better. So be ready and don't uncap them and don't open the package until you are absolutely ready. After the drying element has been installed, no, you don't have two choices. You only have one, or yes, you do. You either use nitrogen or nothing. You do not put shot air at this time. This is the time to be professional and put the nitrogen. I'll show you how to do that. You're going to pull a vacuum. That's an important step. We're almost at the end. We don't need any more oil. We've got the, all the oil in. Charge means to add the refrigerant. We're going to intentionally undercharge. You're going to get information about charging the system. And I customize, I'll explain, a little less. More is not better, no way. Adding more refrigerant is going to make it hotter. And you may not believe me at this time, but adding a little less is going to make it colder. Stick around, I'll explain it during principles of refrigeration. All right, you got the Freon in. Start the engine, turn on the AC. Let's look, let's listen, let's feel, let's take some measurements. Let's take a look at the blue. Let's take a measurement on the red. We're going to do the vent temperature. You do proper disconnect. And yes, it's time to collect that tip. That's what it's all about. Here's your bonus lesson. You see that little washer he's holding? Well, it turns out it's actually a shim. A shim is a selective thickness. Now, there's some on the work table. Now, he's holding one of those guys in there. And this is what is used on some compressors to adjust the air gap. We mentioned it, and it can be measured. And you can just use a business card. This air gap right here is going to get excessive to the point that it doesn't work anymore. It is normal for the clutch and the pulley to wear. And as wear takes place, the gap gets increased and it gets to a certain point where it physically will not engage. Sometimes there's a quick, easy fix. How do you test for an excessive air gap? No, you don't measure it. You push it with the stick. Yes. If you suspect, when should you suspect excessive air gap? You suspect excessive air gap when there's plenty of pressure, static. There's plenty of Freon in there and the clutch doesn't kick in. Before you get all carried away trying to test sensors and relays and coils, you look at the air gap. A good technician, he can spot that excessive air gap because the limit is less than a thin dime. If that air gap looks excessive it doesn't take but a couple of seconds to use the stick on it but you got to know exactly where to push on it and that's where i come in and show you in the shop how to do that you take the clutch off but what's going to happen is it's going to turn so you're going to have to need a backup no yes there's special tools but all you need what does that look like that looks like an oil filter wrench a large channel lock to work for you if there's room to get a power tool in there, that'll get that passenger out of there. Sometimes the clutch just slides right off because we're trying to get to that shim. Sometimes the clutch needs a little help. By the time you get to this, where the clutch doesn't come off that easy, it probably doesn't have the shim. Yes, you can do some research. Does this clutch have an adjustable shim? Because there's plenty of them that don't, about half of them adjust the air gap by using shims, the other half presses it onto the shaft. And if you have to use a puller 
to take the clutch off, more than likely there is no shim. So once you get the clutch off, guess what you're going to do with that, that shim? Guess, guess. You're going to throw it away. By removing the selective shim, now the air gap, the clutch is closer to the pulley, and now it works. You tighten it up. And no, it's not rigged. It's fixed. You adjusted the clutch. You just saved somebody a bunch of money. You think this is a good place to stop? I think so. Dun, dun, 